So we're going to talk today again about personal responsibilities. We've been doing this for almost a month now, but there's just so much stuff to be said about personal responsibilities, carrying a load or carrying a burden. You know, that's the whole theme. It, this whole series of lessons is taken from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, and then down in verse number 5, where Paul says two things to the Galatians that might seem at first to be a little contradictory, but when you understand what he's saying, they're not contradictory at all. First of all, he says, carry each other's burdens. But in order to understand what that really means, we've got to understand what a burden is. And then he says, each one should carry their own load. And then we need to understand what a load is. Because if you're not careful, you'll wind up trying to carry somebody else's load instead of carrying their burden. And when you do that, you do them a disservice because when you carry their load, you're letting them be irresponsible. And we want to talk about personal responsibilities and the boundaries that we need to draw uh, when it comes to our personal responsibilities. You see, followers of Jesus often find it difficult to define what is their personal responsibility and what is not. And it seems to get worse each decade in America because our government is helping us. Very, I mean, the government doesn't do a lot of things well, but they do this well. The government does a really good job at encouraging people to be ear responsible don't be responsible and get out and get a job we'll give you unemployment and then we'll keep extending it and if a pandemic comes along we'll give you more not to work than you would have made working i mean hey don't get out and get a job lay on the couch and be a couch potato and we'll give you food stamps and we'll put you on welfare we'll pay you not to work i mean how good is that our government really is good at that okay so this whole thing about finding it difficult to, to distinguish what is my responsibility and what isn't, this isn't a new problem. It goes at least back to the first century, and the truth is it goes back way further than that. But it goes at least that far back because Paul wrote to the believers in the churches of Galatia to help them clarify this issue. And if it wasn't a problem, then he wouldn't have had to write to them about it. First of all, he says... In Galatians 6, 2, the first part of that verse, carry each other's burdens. And then three verses later, down in verse number 5, he says each one should carry their own load. And as I said, that sounds a little contradictory until you clearly define the difference between a burden and a load. The Greek word translated burden refers to a load that's too heavy for one person to safely carry. Trying to carry a burden by yourself would be like trying to carry a boulder by yourself. It would be dangerous. It could crush you. We need help with these burdens. We need help with the crises and tragedies of life that have the potential to overwhelm us and crush us. Sometimes you've been there, right? When some tragedy, some crisis comes along and it's just too big for you to carry. And if you're stubborn and try to carry that for yourself, you can hurt yourself. You need to let other people come along and help you carry your burdens. And that's what Paul was talking about when he wrote there in verse number two, carry each other's burdens. On the other hand, the Greek word translated load refers to the personal belongings that a first century travel would have carried in his backpack. God makes each of us responsible for carrying the contents of our own backpack. And that's why Paul wrote in verse 5 of Galatians 6, each one should carry their own load. There's a difference between a burden and a load. We've already looked at several components of an individual's personal load, our personal responsibilities. And I'm going to go back and list for you a few of the things that we've talked about. We talked about the consequences of your actions. And we talked about your ongoing basic needs. That's a part of your backpack stuff. You need to be carrying that yourself. Your personal pursuit of truth. Don't blame somebody else if you don't know the truth. That's your personal load. The training of your children. Don't expect somebody else to do the hard work of training your children. The discipline of your children. Don't whine when your children grow up to be no telling what if you don't bother to discipline them when they're growing up. So that's your load. Choosing your companions. That's a biggie, isn't it? 
That's your personal load, and you need to do it well. Controlling your thoughts, that's part of your personal load. That's your responsibility. Identifying and using your talents. Identifying and using your gifts. We talked about those last week. Today, we're going to look at two more personal responsibilities that every man and every woman has. We're going to look at two more components of that load of stuff that should be in your backpack that you ought to be carrying. You can't push this off on anybody else, and you shouldn't expect somebody else to carry this for you. Today, we're going to talk about, for you men, loving your wife, and for you women, respecting your husband. Those are two things that God clearly tells us to do. When I am doing premarital counseling and I'm talking to these young people that are about to get married, I explain to them that his primary responsibility in that marriage is to love his wife and that her primary responsibility in that marriage is to respect her husband. And if they get those two things right, they're going to avoid a lot of other problems down the road. They are going to be a, a long ways down the road towards staying married for a lifetime, which is what God's plan is. So we're going to talk about those two things today. Now, this lesson is based on the biblical belief. I need to preface this. I used to not have to do this. The sermons used to could be a lot shorter. I used to not have to do this, but I have to do this today because of our American culture and our government. The Supreme Court has helped us have to do this, okay? It's based on the belief that the only accurate, only accurate definition of marriage is the union of one man and one woman for one lifetime. Get that? One man, one woman, one lifetime. Not two men, not two women, not a man and an other, or a woman and an other, because I ain't no other. You're either male or female. That's what God says. And if you have some confusion about that, see me after service and I can help you with that. Okay? Scripture clearly indicates that God's plan for marriage is to last a lifetime. One man, one woman, one lifetime. Paul explained this fact when he wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 7, verse number 2. He wrote this, By law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. So how long does marriage last? It's supposed to last for a lifetime until one of them dies. In this case, he's talking to the woman about the woman. So he says that that marriage is in place as far as God is concerned until he dies. By law, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then how long do marriage laws last? A lifetime. When one of the parties dies, the marriage is over. Get that? It's not supposed to be over until then. But at that point, the marriage is over. People all the time, spouse dies. And, I, and listen, my heart goes out to people when their spouse dies. It really does. I'm selfish. I hope I die before Miss Jenny does. Because it would be really hard for me to get along without her. Okay? But I want to give you this. I want to give you this. Here's the thing. Sometimes a spouse dies, and the other person just goes into deep grief, and that's normal. But you're not supposed to stay in deep grief, are you? You're supposed to move through the valley of the shadow of death. And then they'll just moan and wail about, I want to go to heaven and be with my husband. I want to go to heaven and be with my wife. Guess what? When they died... They ceased to be your husband or your wife. Isn't that what this verse said? When you get to heaven, honey, he ain't going to be your husband. You say, praise God. You know? <laughs> it, it ain't going to happen that way. When we get to heaven, there, marriage is not an issue anymore because marriage is an earth relationship. It is not a heaven relationship. The only relationship that's going to be important when we get to heaven is that Jesus is our Lord, that God is our Father, that we are brothers and sisters. That will be the supreme only relationship that matters at that point. You get that? And so we need to understand that marriage is temporary 
but it's supposed to last until the death of one of the spouses. Okay, that's God's plan. That's, all, that's clear all the way through the Scripture. Scripture also clearly indicates that marriage is designed by God as a union between one man and one woman, not two men or two women, as I've already said. Moses wrote it like this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 22, and then down in verse number 24. He said, The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. That's your first anesthesia ever given. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. There is your first surgery in the human family. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one I want you to get this. This was clearly the union of one man, because he uses that word man in that verse, and one woman. That's clearly what this, what this was. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her, her, to the man. You get that? You got a man and a woman, and God brought her to him, and then God united them in marriage. And he says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And then they too become one flesh. Now, I want to tell you this. Man is pretty clear there, right? That's a male of the human species. Woman is pretty clear there, right? But then he changes to wife. You know how the woman became the wife? God married him. Now she's a wife. Now I want to give you this, because some people misunderstand this today. Our government's helping us. Some people misunderstand this today. A wife is always a female. Get that? I have had men introduce to me their male partner as my wife. Most of the time, I just put my phone. Sometimes I say, no, he's not. I want you to understand. This is, we laugh about that, right? But we're living in a world who don't get it. We're living in a world who doesn't get this. And so this is clearly the union of one man and one woman. And with that being said, let's move on before I get in trouble. Let's talk about loving your wife. That's talking about a man, a male, loving his female wife. Men are commanded in Scripture to love their wives. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, do what? Love your wives. Men, that's part of the load we are supposed to carry is to love our wives. Now, I want to give you fellas this. Can I give you this? You know why God tells us to do stuff? Because he knows we don't do it very well. Right? Why would God tell us to love our wives if that's just a natural inclination that we have? You see, that's why, why God tells us to do stuff is because he knows we're not going to do it on our own, and so he's got to tell us. He's got to get our attention. It's like my oldest son talking to his oldest daughter. God has to get us by the cheeks and say, focus, focus. He does her that way. She's a teenage girl, and he still does her that way. And so, in fact, he may do her more that way now than he used to when she was little. But the whole thing is this. We have got to understand that it's our responsibility to love our wives. It's part of the load that we're supposed to carry. Now, just so anybody didn't get the wrong idea, you can only have one wife. Only, you're only supposed to have one. Because look at that, what that says. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ, it goes on to say, loved the church. And gave himself for it. In spite of what we do today in global Christianity, how many churches does God have? One. Now that church is visible 
in local churches scattered all over the world. But when God talks about the church generally, he talks about the church. Isn't that what Jesus said? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Husbands love your wives. Multiple husbands, multiple wives, but only one pair of each. Love your wives, how? Even as Christ loved the church. In other words, Jesus only has one bride, and that's the church. And a man should only have one wife, and that's the woman he's married to. So don't go loving somebody else's wife. Can I say that? Don't go loving somebody else's wife. You love the one that is your wife. That's God's command. Now, to obey this command, men must properly define the word love. Love. It amazes me how people, men and women alike, in our current American culture, struggle to define the word love. I like to do this. I won't do it this morning. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't know why not, but gone this far. Um, but I want you to get this. Sometimes I just ask people in a small group when we're having a Bible study or something and we talk about love, I say, define love. I get all kinds of different answers. Love is this, love is that, love is this, love is something else. I almost never get the real answer unless they've heard me teach this before. I almost never get the real answer. Here's what love is, and I want to give you this from Scripture, but I want to give you the definition first. Love is a sacrificial commitment to the well-being of another person. That's what love is. Love isn't an emotion. Love is a cold, calculated decision that you make in your will. You get that? It is a decision that you make. Love is not something you fall into. Oh, I fell in love. Well, a few weeks later, you can fall out of that whatever it was, love is a cold, calculated decision to be sacrificially committed to the well-being of another person. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with your emotions. Now, emotions may come, but the emotion is not the love. Love is that, that decision to be committed to your well-being. And here's how I know that. The most well-known verse in the entire Bible is a remarkable description of love. It's John 3.16. Where Jesus said, and by the way, I think we can take Jesus' word for most anything, don't you? Where Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now let's look at what God's love looked like. When God loved he made a sacrificial commitment to the well-being of the entire human race, didn't he? It was a decision that God made. It wasn't something he stumbled into. It wasn't something he did without a lot of forethought. He had been thinking about this for all eternity. And then he followed through. He gave his one and only son. Talk about sacrificial commitment. God so loved that he did what? Gave his one and only son. Let me tell you this. Love gives. Love does not take. You get that? Love is generous. Love is not selfish. Do you understand that? And so... God's kind of love motivated him to make a sacrificial, the biggest sacrificial commitment in the history of the world. And that commitment, that sacrificial commitment, was that he gave his one and only son. That was a huge sacrifice on his part. And he did it because he was committed to our well-being. We desperately needed eternal life. Without it, we would perish and he was so committed to our well-being that we not perish but that we have eternal life that he made a sacrificial investment in that he sacrificed his only son so you see what love looks like it's a sacrificial commitment to the well-being of somebody else it's an intentional decision that you make 
Somebody says, I need to get a divorce preacher. I just don't love her anymore. I say, get over it. Make up your mind to love her. Decide to love her. You just can't make your heart love somebody. Oh, but yes, you can. God does that for you every day. Does God love you because you are so warm and wonderful? No, God loves you not because of who you are, but in spite of who you are. And you need to love her not because of who she is, but in spite of who she is. Because if you just love her because of who she is, most days you won't. You get that? Now, ladies, I'm sorry I said that about you, but it's true. Because you're sinners just like we are. And so we gotta, we got to understand what love really is. Women. Women have a deep need to feel loved because they were created with what I call a relational orientation. <laughs> I've been using that word for decades, orientation. But in about the last decade, the world's picked up on that word and they want to talk about your sexual orientation. Your sexual orientation is determined by the DNA that's built into every cell of your being. And that sexual orientation is either male or female. And if you've got the male chromosomes, then you have a male sexual orientation. If you've got female chromosomes, you have a female sexual orientation. Now, the devil may come along and lie to you and tell you that you're a female trapped in a male's body or a male trapped in a female's body, but he is a liar. You get that? We just need to clear that up. We need to clear that up. Now, that doesn't mean I don't love people that struggle with gender identity issues. I do. I love them enough to try to tell them the truth about that. Because God's perfect plan for them is to be who he made them to be. Get that? Not try to take that into, the, into their own hands and hire some surgeon to try to change that. God wanted them to be who he made them to be. So, so the, these women that are created to be female, when God created them, he created them with a relational orientation. And the very foundation of every healthy relationship is love. It's love. This aspect of a woman was clear to Adam the first time he laid his eyes on Eve. He, he clearly recognized why God made Eve. And I don't think there was any doubt that he understood that because God made her to do what God made her to do, that God created her with a very relational orientation. She needed to be able to love deeply and because of that she also needs to be loved deeply she needs to feel that love i'm going to give you this this is what moses wrote this is what adam did it's in genesis 3 20 adam named his wife eve now i've told you this before but i want you to get this every time a name is given in the old testament in hebrew it wasn't just a word a pretty sounding word that identified a person. It was a word already in the Hebrew language that had a meaning. And they used that name to describe the person. Do you know what the word Eve means? Mother. Because look what he says in the, next, in the next phrase. He even tells us. Adam named his wife Eve. Why? Because she would become... The what? Mother of all the living. The first time Adam saw Eve, he realized that she was made to be a mother. She was a baby-making machine. He knew that. First time he laid eyes on her, he figured that out. He looked at her and said, wow, she ain't like me. She is a baby-making machine machine god designed women to produce and nurture babies and say you are just really putting women down into a low view no being a mother is the highest calling on the planet nurturing children has the potential to make a bigger impact on the planet than anything else you could do it can affect the world for generations to come either negatively or positively 
She was going to be the mother of all living. And God designed women to produce and to nurture babies. And to do so, they need the capacity to, to develop deep and meaningful relationships with those babies. What do babies need? Especially in the formative years of their lives. They need a deep relationship with mama, don't they? They need to be nurtured and cuddled and caressed and fed. And I mean, I could go on and tell you some stuff that might embarrass you, but I, I won't. So he created women to be relationally oriented. They need meaningful relationships and they also give deep love in a meaningful relationship. For that reason, God inspired Paul to write, husbands do what? Love your wives. She needs it. She needs for you to effectively communicate to her that you love her. For a woman, love is the key to a meaningful relationship. Now, let's take a survey. Ladies, am I telling the truth? Am I, love is the mean, that's the real foundation for a meaningful relationship, right? Once you understand what love really is. And guys, love is not lust. Love is that sacrificial commitment to her well-being and and she needs that. She needs that. It isn't enough, guys, for women to be loved. They need to feel loved. Now, here's the real trick, fellas. It's not just loving her. It's figuring out how to make her feel that love. That's the real key. That's the real key. And since every woman is different, each husband must study his wife to learn how to make her feel loved. You say, study her? Absolutely. Absolutely. You get married to her? Now, I want to tell you this. I think I've told you this before, but I want to tell you this again. I conduct a lot of wedding ceremonies, right? I do lots of funerals. I do lots of weddings. Okay? Somebody said they're about the same. I'm really not. But... Anyway, at every wedding ceremony, there are actually six people standing up there with the pastor. Did you know that? Every time, never fails. You know who those six people are? There is the man he thinks he is. And there is the woman she thinks she is. And then there is the man that she thinks he is and then there is the woman that he thinks she is and most of the time they ain't the same you get that and shortly after the honeymoon they both begin to figure that out okay and then there's the guy he really is and the guy she really is and those are the two that are going to struggle through this as they figure out that she ain't who I thought she was, and he ain't who I thought he was, and I'm not even who I thought I was. I didn't know that that side of me was in there until he really got on my last nerve. Am I telling the truth here? That's the way it is. So the real challenge, guys, is to make her feel loved. And you've got to study her, and some of that's trial and error. Because these women like to play this game. I heard a Christian comedian explain this one time. He said, my wife loves to play games. I don't like games. He said, every morning when we wake up, she loves to play this game. He said, the name of the game is, guess what mood I'm in today. <laughs> and he said, I ain't very good at that game. You get this? So what I'm trying to explain to you is this, that you've got to study her. And some of it's trial and error. You think this will really make her feel good. And you try and she burst into tears. Oh, you don't love me. Don't do that again. <laughs> try something else. And then try something else. And eventually you'll hit it. You'll hit it, something that she really feels good about that. Put that in your notebook. You need a manual. And you're going to have to write your own. Because there ain't one wrote for her already. It's not like there's one manual and, and it'll work for every woman because they're all different. Do you get that? So you got to study her. 
you got to figure out what makes her feel loved and then do that. And you say, but that's so awkward to me. Do it. Do it. You'll get over the awkwardness, but you won't get over what's going to come if you don't learn to do this. You got to make her feel loved. It's just part of it's just part of the thing about being married. She's got to feel that love. She's got to be able to take that love in and no two women do that exactly alike. And so so Paul explained it like this guys about studying her. Likewise, this is it's not Paul, it's Peter. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 7. He said likewise this is King James, so it says ye husbands, I would say you husbands. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them, live with them. So who, who does God here give permission to live with the wife? The husband. Not the boyfriend. Not the fiance. Not the baby daddy. Who is it? Husbands, dwell with them. How? According to knowledge. How do you get knowledge? You have to learn, don't you? You're going to have to learn to live with her. If you don't, you will learn to battle with her. You get that? You've got to learn to live with her. You have to learn how to make her feel loved so that you can live with her according to knowledge. It would be nice if they came with a manual, but they don't. Your particular wife is unique, so you need to study her so that you can live with her according to knowledge. You need to learn how to make her feel loved. And men, if you want to have a good marriage, then carry your load. Learn how to make her feel love. Now, I want to stop and say this. Most men judge the quality of their marriage on one big thing. It's that three-letter word that starts with an S and ends with an X. Isn't that right? Most men do. I mean, they gauge the quality of their marriage on how things are in that department. She don't. And guys, I've got to tell you this. If you want that part of the marriage to be good, you better learn to carry your load in making her feel loved because she will not respond to you like you want her to sexually if you don't learn to make her feel loved. Ladies, am I telling these guys the truth? Okay, now let's move on from that one. I think I've been on the men long enough. Let's go ahead and get on to the women. You ready for this, ladies? I'm sure you guys are. The next part of carrying our load is for the women, and it's respecting your husbands, and I can see eyes rolling back as I speak. You see, men are not so relationally oriented. They are more task-oriented. Isn't that true? Most men find their identity. It shouldn't be this way, but I'm just telling you how it is. Most men don't find their identity in Christ. That's where we're supposed to find it. Most men find their identity in what they can do. Something they can do. And sometimes that determines what job they have. And so when you talk to them for very long, they're going to be talking to you about their job. That's why it kills men to get fired from a job. It's a personal insult. I can't do this. When God created Adam, he created him to accomplish a task. Do you remember that in the book of Genesis? What was the task? Take care of the garden. Take care of this garden. This is what Moses wrote, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, the first part of the verse, and then down in verse 15. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. So God planted him a garden. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, now look at this, to work it and take care of it. So why did God create the man and then put him in his garden? For a task. Somebody needs to work this garden, somebody needs to take care of this garden, and he created the man to do that, and then he put him in there. 
to do it. So when he created Adam to take care of that garden, he created Adam with a task orientation, not so much a relational orientation. Because men are task oriented, they tend to need respect, admiration for their ability to accomplish a task. Men need that. Now, they might not admit it. I don't care what anybody thinks. Give me a break. You do too. Men need admiration. They need respect. They might not want to admit it, but they need it. God created us to be task-oriented, and along with that comes this need for respect. And here's how I know that. Because this is what he tells the women to do. This is in Ephesians 5.33. Right after he tells the men to love their wives because they're not very good at it. Then guess what he tells women to do because they're not very good at this sometimes. Guess what he tells them to do? The wife must... Ooh. What's that word must mean? Ladies, this is a command, right? This is a requirement. She must do what? Respect her husband. And the woman says, you don't know how hard that would be with my husband. You know, I'm looking for something he can do good. And I haven't found it yet. I would say, you're an idiot if you married that kind of loser. You get that? I mean, I mean, there's something that God designed him to do. If he ain't figured out what it is, you to help him figure it out. Because you need to be able to respect him because he is not going to be loyal to you long term if he doesn't feel like in you he can find a fan club. In you he can find somebody that will admire him and respect him for who he is and what he can do. He needs that. He don't need to hear you all time criticizing him, telling him what a loser he is, even if he is. Help him find something he can do so you can brag on that. You say, I've been looking for years. Keep looking. He needs that. He needs that. That's why he says this. The wife must respect her husband. A man will generally be loyal to his wife if he believes she admires and respects him for the things he can do. Ladies, making your husband Feel respected is part of the load you are to carry. Now, girls, I want to give you this little warning. If you are not God's woman committed to carrying your load and figuring out how to make him feel admired and respected, find something he can do and brag on him about that repeatedly. Build him up about that. Because most men struggle with self-esteem because they're task-oriented and they don't feel like they can do their task as good as they ought to. And so, and so if, you don't, if you don't make it your mission to make him feel respected, the devil will bring along somebody who will. The devil will bring along some she-bandit to try to steal your husband. Get that? That'll happen. And she'll tell him how good he is at this and how good he is at that and how good he is at something else. And he'll fall for that. And before you know it, he's chasing after her and you're left in the dust. Does that make sense to you? You say, well, if he wants her, let him have her. <laughs> he wouldn't want her so bad if you made him feel admired and respected. And remember God's plan? One woman, one man, how long? one lifetime that's god's plan so ladies i want to encourage you just carry your load even jesus let me give you this about men even jesus as a man was task oriented did you know that study him just study the the four gospels what was he always doing some task he was a busy fellow he was doing all kinds of stuff and when he paused long enough to articulate his life purpose, this is what he said. It's in Luke 19.10. The Son of Man, that's what he generally called himself, came to do a task, to seek and to save the lost. Seeking and saving the lost was a task. You get that? 
Jesus' life purpose was centered around a task. He was task-oriented. When, when God chose to highlight, let me give you just some other men. When God chose to highlight the faith of his most outstanding men, he did so by calling attention to the tasks that they had performed for him. Because you know why he did that? Because you know what faith does? Faith motivates you to work. Because faith without work is dead. Faith is going to motivate you to work. It's gonna, and for men, that means what? And give me something to do. Give me a task. Give me a challenge. Give me something to do. And when God got ready to call attention to the great faith of some men in Scripture, he pointed out what they did. You women, you say, my husband, he, he's not even a good Christian. He doesn't have any faith at all. You want to help that? Point him toward doing something for Jesus and then brag on him when he does it. Respect him when he does it. That'll motivate him. He's task-oriented. Let me give you the author of the book of Hebrews wrote this. He wrote it in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to give you some excerpts from verses 4 all the way down to verse number 27. Get this. By faith, Abel, by the way, he was a man, brought God a better offering than Cain did. What was that? That was a task. You know what else is built into that one? Competition. Men tend to be competitive, don't they? So that's what he says here. He says, he brought a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Noah, Noah was a man. What did he do? He was in the construction business. He built an ark to save his family. We talk about Noah's faith, and what did it center on? His task. He built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, he was a man. When God tested him, he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Wow. He was going to offer his own son as a burnt offering. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Called attention to Isaac's faith, and what was it? It's what he did for his sons. He blessed them. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, you say, he'll finally get past that. When he gets old enough, he'll quit needing this affirmation for stuff that he does. Jacob was dying. By faith, when he was dying, he's an old man. He blessed each of Jacob's or Joseph's sons. And God called attention to that as an old man. The thing that marked his faith was what he did. And then by faith, Joseph, when he was, when his end was near, so now here's another old man. What does he do? He spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and said, take my bones with you when you go. You remember that part of the story? By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. What is, he, what is that all about? Men motivated to high levels of faith, and that's expressed by what they do. Men are task-oriented. You women need to know that. Women need to understand that one of the deepest needs of their husbands is the respect of their wives, your admiration for the tasks he can perform. That's why Paul wrote, the wife must respect her husband. So ladies, if you want to have a good marriage, carry your load. And that's part of it. Here's a conclusion. One of the keys to a successful marriage is a husband who carries his load by making his wife feel loved. Paul wrote that. Husbands, love your wives. That's Ephesians 5.25. And then another key to a successful marriage is a wife who carries her load by making her husband feel respected. That's why Paul wrote, the wife must respect her husband. You get that? So we've all got a load to carry. And ladies, he is not your load to carry, but making him feel respected is your load. And fellas, don't start looking at her as your load to carry, but making her feel loved is part of the stuff that should be in your backpack, and you ought to carry it. Don't expect somebody else to do it for you. You get that? Got to get that. We're gonna have, if we're going to turn this divorce epidemic around, we've got to learn these basic fundamentals. Carry your load. Take up your personal responsibilities. You say, but I've already blown it. Never too late to start. Start 
today.